All right, thanks everybody for joining uh, to the first CIN talk of 22. Uh, glad that we have a couple of ESNet people that are going to be able to kick us off and talking about an exciting research project that we've heard about internally for a little bit, but now we're ready to share some of the results and talk a little bit about it uh, within the community. Uh, so we have Miriam, Scott, and Nick that are going to be going over this, and Miriam is going to be leading and driving. Uh, so I will turn it over to you, Miriam. Thank you, Jason. So, uh, hi everyone. So again, uh, I guess we can still say Happy New Year. So um, we're going to be talking about uh, our work, which we've been working on for about more than a year now, called data-driven machine learning dynamic path optimization. Um, so this is a work which we're working on collaboratively between our own unique skills to this particular project. Um, so. Today's talk is going to be more focused on how we've designed the AI and how we've got the AI to make sense uh, that it's doing the right thing. Uh, the actual project, we have a few slides in the end with Scott and Nick will talk about on how we're actually building the project, uh, Hecate, and uh, uh, how we're going to take it forward. But this talk is going to be more focused on the AI part of Hecate. So, Starting off, so uh, I've been working on this area for about four years now, uh, looking at how uh, ESNet, such as, and other RNE networks become the nervous system for large scale sciences. Um, and what we've seen is that the networks are built for resilience. So, for example, the graph on the bottom shows uh, the average utilization of ESNet links has mostly been up to 40% on average. And that's the same pattern across the different as well. And the reason for this is that we actually build for sudden bursts, science bursts. So for example, if there's a big data transfer, the network link is able to cope with that uh, increased demand. But what this also shows is that our resources are often very underutilized. Um, how can we actually allow the networks to run hotter is one of the challenges which we are looking at. So uh, we also want to make the quality of the network transfer is very good, especially when we're using TCP traffic, which is very sensitive to packet loss and congestion patterns as well. So we're working on this idea that if we can predict what the network can look like, can we then adapt the infrastructure to cope with those particular challenges? And basically that means is we're trying to optimize the network resources or the links or the band way to adapt to the variable workloads which we see in our science traffic. So um, in terms of the innovations, uh, um, so somebody's complaining about my audio. I guess it's okay. Yeah, you're a little bit choppy, Miriam. Okay. Should I do something? Uh, if you have another microphone, maybe. <laughs> Is this better now? Yes, that is a lot better. Okay, I just moved the laptop and it goes on. So, um, okay, so uh, what are the innovations which AI is going to be bringing about? So uh, in the recent years, network research, we've seen a lot of discussion on network researchers using AI. And there is this famous quote from uh, uh, Beamster and networks should learn to drive themselves. And they have a series of discussions on what that actually means. In our approach, what we are arguing is that AI can do simple actions such as improve availability or resilience, such as security challenges in the network. Our argument is that we are building AI for mission critical actions. And for us, is more to do with traffic engineering. So that's one of the mission critical actions which we're looking at. So the diagram at the bottom here kind of summarizes the different AI approaches on the network. So if we have a network uh, cartoon here, which you can have uh, controllers such as Ryu or Oscar is the one which we normally use, and you're collecting all kinds of network telemetry, you can then pull that information from the telemetry to either do supervised or unsupervised classification, which we've been using for doing anomaly detections, or you can also pull 
in that data to do forecasting of what the network traffic is going to look like in the future. So these are two different approaches of AI. All of this information can then feed into a third approach of AI, which goes into uh, an AI agent, which can then make actions based on what uh, it's perceiving the network is doing. And that basically executes control, uh, control, which is then fed through the controllers to actually introduce that actions into the network. That particular one uh, uses a reward function to see how well I performed. So through trial and error, this AI agent can be trained to actually do the right action at the right time in the network. So this is my summary of how a self-driving network can tackle the three different AI approaches. Uh, but there are other ways in which uh, we can go into these in detail and, and add more stuff uh, into it. Network as a deep learning here. Um, and I'm specifically talking about the training loop over here. So um, we have the network cartoon again here, and we're looking at the network telemetry. So this becomes our observation. And then we train our deep reinforcement learning, for example, which I have a few details on next. Uh, to do the right action, which is basically reconfiguring the network. And by reconfiguring the network, we're thinking of updating flow tables and forwarding rules so that that introduces that action into the network. For the reward function, we're looking at maybe flow completion time or the latency across the network. And this can be defined as how we want uh, the network to be optimized over time. Now, within deep uh, learning approaches, there are two ways of doing deep learning. So there is either a model-based approach or model-free approach. So model-based is where uh, you predict what the future is going to look like, you study the patterns and you make decisions based on that. A model-free is you don't know what the network is going to look like, but you learn what the actions should be. So a very simple example could be if I'm trying to get to San Francisco airport, I look at Google Maps and I plan my trip. So that's a model-based approach where I look at a model of the road network and I'm planning my trip. But in my own experience, if I know that if I travel at 9 a.m. versus 5, 5 p.m., the traffic's going to be different on the roads. So I can use that information to plan my trip as well. So that becomes a model-free approach where I don't know what the model of the network is looking like, but I, I know what the right action should be based on my experience. So this is how we use the network and model it as a mark of decision process. So uh, in this example here, we have a four node network, uh, A, B, C, D, D, and we're trying to model uh, a flow going from A to D. So what we do is that um, the state of the network is represented by the observation, which we take, which is the current network statistics. You take an action, and then based on that, you move on to another state, uh, which then allows you to take another action. And over time, you can represent this as a probability of given this state and given this action, which is the next state you move on to. And that very easily allows us to represent a network as a market property. Uh, which is basically a dynamic system with state action pairs. And once we have this, we can very easily model it as a deep learning approach. Um, so on the top here is you have the observation of the current state. We're training a neural network in the middle to actually learn which particular actions I should take. So either go by a C or go by a B to achieve uh, the goal which it wants to achieve. And then based on what it's done, it gets a reward to know which action was the best. So this is the logic we're taking in into our AI or uh, Hecate. And we're introducing this intelligent controller, which is based on deep reinforcement learning. So uh, we have a network topology, which is represented by a maze over here. Again, I'm, I'm trying to really drill in how we're modeling the state and the actions here. Uh, so the state is looking at the network monitoring data, the current topology of the network. It learns that into the controller and the action is the control. The rewards we're looking at are efficiency, utilization, latency. And we've made this flexible enough that users can define their own rewards on how they want the network to be optimized. In order for all of this to work, uh, we had to design simulations uh, because the AI agent trains a 
against but this simulation is again driven by real-time data coming in so that's why we are able to mimic real conditions when training the ai so we designed our own custom gyms for this um, and it's able to learn different kinds of reward functions so we can pull in a different gym whenever we want to allow the ai to learn specific things and we also simulate real conditions through historical data sets and we can also link it through real-time data so it's actually mimicking what's happening in the real world and training an AI before it's actually deployed onto the network. So the AI actually learns a bunch of things, which makes it very powerful compared to how we currently do routing on the network. So the state looks at the current traffic allocated across all the links. It also looks at performance data, loss, latency, throughput. And uh, another addition, which we are also thinking of doing is are the currently traffic uh, patterns allocated are those elephant flows versus mice flows so that can be a very easy input coming from a classification approach to see what kind of uh, traffic patterns are currently running on the network and then the actions are basically you're allocating incoming flows to different paths and through trial and error over time you can collect a reward function to see what was the best strategy at the particular state which was given. so the beauty of this approach is that once trained, the AI knows that if current conditions exist in the, uh, in the state, and I do this action A, this will give me the optimum result. So this is how the AI knows that this is the best way I can move forward um, and make optimum results uh, as we go forward. Um, any questions until this point? I don't see any yet, Miriam, but uh, anybody who does, please just type them in and we'll make sure they get answered. Okay. So, um, so the deep reinforcement learning, again, is a very um, powerful building, uh, building approach where we have four different spaces, memory model, the reward function, and the policies it learns. So, Mapping it how, what it means for networks is the memory is represented as a linked list of the current state of the network, the action it did and the reward it got. The gym environments represent the model of the network, um, which we've done. Then the state and the action values represent the reward functions, which we've already explained. And then the policy is, you can also learn certain actions that rather than doing, um, this action now, I can do an action which will actually give me a good result 10 steps later. So you can learn these longer term policies for the network as well. Um, so what we did hey, Miriam, was, we did, yes. We did have a question come in. It was uh, related to the, the previous slide. Uh, Hans wanted to know how, how are you trying to figure out the difference between an elephant and a mouse flow in real time or near real time? So uh, we've been designing classification algorithms for uh, using NetFlow data. We did unsupervised clustering uh, using um, Gaussian mixture models. Uh, so we have a classifier, which we've pre-trained, and then we deploy this pre-trained classifier at the edge. So when a flow comes in, it basically runs through that classifier, classifies it as an elephant versus mice. And then that information goes in saying that uh, I think this is an elephant. This is what I'm going to do. Okay, thank you. So, um, okay, so the um, our motivation for this is to do improved traffic engineering, um, basically because this is driven by a lot of conversations we've had uh, and some of the real world challenges we see in ESN. Um, and plus the experiences of Nick and Scott have uh, showed us some opportunities of using this with segment routing, programmable data planes, and also because we work with in-house controllers quite a bit. So it seemed like an easy problem to tackle with AI. So here AI can learn multi multiple actions. We're also adding multi-objective optimization. Um, so there has already been work on complex resource uh, optimization in HPC uh, by, a work, uh, by a group in MIT. Um, and that actually does warrant this deep reinforcement learning approach to improve resources. 
uh, we're trying to apply it on networks. And we already have a baseline as well. So assuming that we're using the shortest possible root algorithms as our baseline, we have something to compare if our AI is doing better or worse. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we, um, it's, it's, it's good to uh, assess whether we're doing a good approach with AI. Is it worth going down or not? So uh, the way we design a reward function, uh, again, there is a lot of maths behind AI, but it's pretty, uh, it's not actually so complicated. Uh, so for example, this is the simplest reward function uh, being calculated at the top, the Bellman optimality equation where you're basically calculating the value that given the previous value of state and action and the reward which we learned, uh, what would be the most optimum value I can take now? So what is the action I should take uh, given that state? Um, so uh, I've tried it's, uh, but basically what happens is that you have these hyperparameters which are represented by alpha and gamma, which are shown over here. This allows you to actually slow down what the reward function is learning. So for example, if you're prioritizing immediate awards versus future awards, or you're actually adding a learning rate, how quickly it learns. And then there's also an exploration factor which you can tell the uh, deep reinforcement learning agent to explore more of the state or just keep it to small spaces as well. So there is a lot of optimization literature on this, which basically is what AI uses. Um, the, in AI approaches, what they do is they try to optimize, they try to do hyperparameter tuning of these hyperparameters. Um, and in deep reinforcement learning, what we're trying to do is to optimize these hyperparameters to train the DRL as quickly as possible, because we don't want to like 10,000 epochs for it to get cleaned uh, as optimally as possible. So for the TE uh, problem, which we're trying to optimize, we have uh, three different optimization things which we're looking at. So we're looking at average network utilization. We're looking at either latency or bandwidth or loss. And uh, we can also optimize for a specific traffic pass, which we will talk about in the end. Um, and that's basically what the intelligence of Hecate is doing. So it's particularly targeting these different traffic classes. We have another question, Miriam. Uh, uh, how do you deal with route oscillations in real time with the machine learning AI approach? And then as an extension to that, how long will it take to learn if a node in the currently selected route is down and you need to predict the new optimum path again? Okay, so so, um, so route oscillation only becomes a problem if you are updating the table constantly. Um, the way which we're uh, targeting this is we um, we are adding checkpoints that you are uh, you update the table once and then you don't update the table until a few. Uh, some time has gone by. So that's experimentation, which we're doing, like when is the optimum? How many times do you wanna keep updating the route, route routing tables? So that reduces the problem of oscillation quite a bit. And I uh, show that we're also doing a centralized learning approach. So that also reduces the oscillation problem as well. Uh, the second question on if the topology has essentially changed, how quickly can the network learn? Uh, we have an experimental result in a few slides, which we've tried that out uh, and shown that how can it uh, be able to really quickly adapt itself, even if a link is lost. Um, so if you can wait a few slides, I can show that in, a, in some time. OK, thank you. Um, so, so this is why I think this slide is going to be really interesting. So, um, so we have been talking about the centralized versus decentralized learning approaches. So in the centralized, it's pretty much how we follow SDN uh, theory that you have a software defined network controller, which is controlling your whole network. So it has a global view of what is happening in the network. So it can actually learn a global optima. So this is very useful if you're trying to do average utilization improvements across the whole network. It looks all at the all, all of the links and it knows how to allocate stuff. 
Uh, then there is another approach which is very powerful. It's a decentralized learning approach. So here we're thinking of porting AI agents per network node uh, so that they learn local versus global optimized ones. In this particular situation, what happens is that each network node learns locally what is best for me, but then they also have a period of consensus where they communicate with all the other agents to make sure that uh, the global optimize is also satisfied. Um, so that is a multi-agent uh, reinforcement learning approach, which we've also been trying out, uh, and we have a paper published on that, So, uh, and I have some results on this as well. So. Um, so this is how we're training the deep reinforcement learning algorithm. So within the deep reinforcement learning literature, the advantage now we have is that there are four or five different types of algorithms within this DRL approach. And all of that has been published in terms of example codes and papers. Uh, so it's very easy for people to go and read up on this to determine which DRL algorithm would be best for their approaches. Uh, in this particular case, we use the actor critic model, which is the DDPG algorithm, stands for deep deterministic policy gradient. And the way it works is that you have two neural networks, which are both looking at what is happening in the network. So they are looking at the observations, but one is updating a value function, which is represented by Q, and one is updating a policy function, which is represented by pi. So, and then we have one, uh, the policy neural network is the one which is actually performing the actions. And then the reward is being influenced into the value function. And as a result of this, this is how you would learn the best policy for your network. So you would actually deploy the, the neural network which was updating its policy function over here. Uh, how these algorithms differ is that compared to the very commonly used DQN, which, uh, which is what we hear about mostly when we talk about AlphaGo or uh, gaming uh, uses DQN quite a lot. It's because DQNs are very good to learn in creep state and discrete action pairs. In challenges, in, in real world challenges where you have continuous state and continuous action pairs, uh, DDPG is better. So this is how those algorithms have developed over time. Uh, and then there are other algorithms as well, which try to tackle different parts of the DRL uh, in order to uh, learn better given a certain situation. Um, and then DDPG has also been proven to work well in complex environments. Uh, that's why we use DDPG. So these are the results of our simulation, basically. So we have a network and we designed the DRL. We simulated for 100 flows per episode. Once it's trained, we save the neural network, we deploy it into the same uh, environment. So this is where it comes into the testing phase. Um, this is a, a graph of the reward, which represents the average utilization. And during training, we find that by the time it reaches 400 iterations, it's like trained the best it can be. So there's no point in training it further. So we can actually stop the training at 200 iterations. And then at that time, we can save the neural network and deploy it into the network for testing. So here are some of the results from a centralized control approach. So our baseline uh, represents the shortest possible root algorithm. Um, and our DRL, a DRL is the DDPG algorithm, which we've been training on. So here we introduce those flows uh, with a Poisson distribution, which we can set ourselves. So again, these are results in simulation. So we can do different kinds of analysis. We looked at the links over time, and we saw that the DRL is able to optimize the, the number of links used compared to the baseline as well. So this is pretty much understandable because the baseline is using the shortest possible root calculations from one link to the next, but the DRL is able to learn that it's not useful to learn uh, to use all of those links and maybe it's, it's found another longer way to go in a different link. Uh, the, the typical result for it, because this was uh, trained for average utilization, we see that the baseline got a sudden peak in the beginning because of the way um, the flows were arriving but the DRL was able to distribute the flows much more nicely. 
as uh, so we see much more of a flatter uh, network utilization rather than these peaks uh, in the shortest possible uh, technique which we used. And then we can also model different kinds of optimizations and then compare it over here in this chart to see if the DRL is actually performing better than those other routing optimization algorithms as well. Any questions on, on these graphs? I have one. What, what is the uh, time step unit? So uh, time step unit here, so this is a simulation. So it's one, one, one run. Okay, thank you. Um, so that was, uh, so those were results in a centralized approach. Uh, I mentioned that we're also looking at decentralized approach. Uh, so the bottom over here is a paper which is published on archive uh, where we model this decentralized approach in WAN. Um, and we simulated for three different topologies before Giant and at and And here again, we're introducing network load for on distribution and measuring the packet delivery time uh, as it goes forward. So what we see is that uh, as network load increases, our decentralized approach or the multi-agent uh, reinforcement learning is able to keep the packet delivery time minimum compared to the other shortest possible route or the other uh, deep learning approaches such as Q and PG as well. So we're also comparing it to other deep reinforcement learning algorithms over here. So that pattern is also seen across all the other network topologies. And one of the reasons for this is that because it's doing local learning versus global learning, it's able to adapt much more quicker for very high network loads as well. So rather than doing much more of a centralized, um, like it takes in all the information and then sends it out, uh, this, the multi-agent is able to do it much more quickly. So that, that's one of the doing it locally versus globally. So what we found is that it actually learns traffic patterns uh, locally better and then optimizes based on that. And we can also integrate it with different network controllers to allow a, a connection with diverse kind of devices, especially when we bring it down to the lower level of decentralized learning approaches. And we're also looking at how this can be extended with current traffic engineering protocols uh, which is the work which we're going to be talking about in the next few slides. Um, this uh, one more question, Miriam. What, what was the uh, the Y access unit on that? Was that milliseconds? Uh, milliseconds, sorry, yeah. Yep, thank you. Um, so here is where possibly the answer to the question about adaptation. Uh, the same simulation, what we did was we started to introduce link failures. So essentially what you're doing is you're changing the topology where controller has been deployed. And what we saw is that with the deep, um, with the decentralized approach, it's able to adapt, the blue line is adapt, we're able to adapt much more quickly than with the centralized approaches as well. So, so let's let's spend some time over here. So in a in a real scenario, what happens is that you have a network and a link fails. If you're using the shortest possible route, uh, you see this particular line colored uh, 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 line. It it doesn't learn that the network has lost until you would do an update where it would recalculate the shortest possible route now that the links have, are missing. So that's why we see the packet loss is constant at that time. Whereas when you were doing a decentralized approach, what, you, what we also introduced was during the training phase, we randomly let it train with failures. So it was able to learn that if a certain failure happens, this is what I should do. And when you're training it, that's the safest time at which, in, which you can train the AI to learn what to do in challenging situations. Um, so that's why in a decentralized approach, locally it saw, okay, this link is gone. What is my next approach going to be? So it was able to adapt much more quicker if, whenever a link fails. We haven't checked uh, for nodes being made available. So that's another thing which we have to check. Um, but it, this decentralized approach definitely shows that with link failures, 
the decentralized reinforcement learning is able to adapt much more quickly. And we have questions. Sorry, Jason, I thought you're moderating. I was, and I thought I was unmuted, but I wasn't. Now I am. Uh, how would you protect the agents centralized, decentralized from adversarial and all attacks? Okay, that's a very good question. We haven't looked at those yet. Um, so there are a bunch of assumptions which we're making in our AI approach. Uh, we haven't started looking at adversarial attacks yet. Um, but that's a good suggestion to start looking at in the future. Okay, thank you. So this is um, where the future is now. So this is the work which we're more excited about. Um, so a lot of my work is a lot of theoretical work because of my background in software engineering and AI. So I'm much more to the math side and making sure that everything is working as it is supposed to be working. Um, so that's why we joined forces. So basically I joined forces with Scott and Nick uh, because we were, the three of us were able to come up with a much more engineering approach to see how these theoretical ideas could be transferred into the practical world. So we've come up with this idea of Hecate, which is basically stands for uh, black magic on the network. And Hecate kind of merges the reinforcement learning approach with a bunch of other AI approaches to uh, in order to bring traffic engineering into reality. Uh, so we've got a patent which was filed at the end of last year on it. Um, and uh, this work is being led by Nick um, over here. So uh, we're looking at how we can bring AI into the data plane where it can communicate with the PCE, for example, and we're also adding a lot of different AI algorithms with the DRL. So you, you can also do prediction and make decisions based on what your predictions are telling you or what um, other kinds of classification algorithms are returning answers. And then the AI uses all of this information to make much more better uh, in, uh, decisions. The, the way we're doing it is we're posting it onto Raspberry Pis and FPGAs so that the AI can train quickly and can also be deployed into the physical world. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, Scott to um, uh, to talk about how the AI is more advanced for Hecate, in in addition to the DRL approach, which we which I was just describing. Okay, can you hear me? Awesome. Okay, so um, to a large degree, I'm going to just kind of chat about some of the ways that we are consuming uh, information from the live environment and how we're interpreting it and using it as intelligence to um, kind of feed the AI component. The way we're looking at it is we're taking, um, the model is that there, there are sites that are communicating over links, which are, you know, seems like a pretty reasonable place to start. Um, and so we look at sites and their characteristics, and we look at links and their characteristics. The site characteristics um, obviously don't change dramatically um, over time, so they have a little bit slower update cycle. Um, but what we do is um, we take a look at kind of NetFlow data, both historically and more or less in real time, and in, in kind of like chunks. And then we do traffic classification on it using um, unsupervised clustering. And essentially, um, we break down these characteristics into time characteristics and data volume characteristics, because you can have, you know, you can either have big flows or little flows over big time or little time. And so there's kind of like, you have your options there. Um, links, on the other hand, are, as we all know, significantly more dynamic. Um, using perf sonar, we track loss, delay, and jitter, and um, take this time series information and um, plug it into a, like a Neo4j database so that we can have like a nice network abstraction. Um, and as suggested in the bullet points on the left, um, 
all of the analysis in here is either just kind of basic statistics or using unsupervised clustering to identify um, traffic and time classes. And the, uh, the learning is, is fairly continuous, um, albeit in discrete time windows. Um, could I get the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so looking at the site clustering, um, with NetFlow data, you obviously have a large number of, um, of variables. And what we've done is um, kind of combine variables in such a way as, you know, when you take a ratio of two variables, you can extract uh, meaningful information from both while consuming only a single dimension in kind of analysis space. Um, and so as suggested before, our, our site modeling is broken into time and data related values, um, which are kind of in the little, in the box in the top right. Um, and so we're interested in general in, you know, the small volume, short time things like uh, video calls or interactive sessions, um, large volume, long time, large data transfers, and then pretty much everything else lives in the middle. Um, and that we can just apply kind of um, default policies to. Um, let's see here. So that that's basically the, the, uh, the visualizations there just kind of show the different clustering that kind of naturally happens. Um, this is a fairly large sample window um, that identifies um, both time and space clustering that happen. And these are what we use to identify um, the, the flow types. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so looking at the links, this is something that I think we're probably all a lot more familiar with. Um, we use perf sonar because it's a super awesome tool and it's in place and it works really well. And um, so obviously in looking at the links, it's not a bi-directional computation because as suggested in the, uh, the latency graph on the right, going in one direction, the latency is significantly different than going in the other. Um, so I think, you know, it's just kind of like going from point A to point B, you get in this case, a very uh, spiky kind of latency, whereas going from point B to point A, you get almost the exact opposite. You have this kind of fat graph there. Um, and so when doing learning off of this kind of information, you definitely want to keep track of which direction you're going in. Um, looking, let's see here. So going over our bullet points, um, perf sonar we use for all the reasons we talked about. Um, connection between two endpoints consists of a minimum of two links. Um, since we do a lot of uh, multi-linking uh, that obviously we can't just assume that there's a single uh, link in between two endpoints. Um, the asymmetry in the connections is described in the, the image on the right, which we already talked about. And um, we are looking at loss, delay, latency, and jitter, but adding more um, individual link components is not a big deal at all because we're designing the kind of uh, computational infrastructure with that in in mind and that we assume that there will be more interesting things to add. Um, next slide, please. And this is just a, uh, a model that we ran uh, and did a presentation at SC this year or last year, I guess. Um, so before there were a smaller, it, using the same model of, um, I believe it was four nodes attached with eight links um, using kind of a naive shortest path, uh, we got um, kind of high link utilization across a small number of links and almost no utilization across most of the rest of them. And after we applied our uh, the Hecate uh, kind of mechanism, we got fairly even link usage across um, all of the links, which was kind of nice in that um, each of the links then would be a lot more uh, resilient to bursts and um, kind of other unexpected behaviors. And uh, next slide, please. 
And the conclusion, I'll let uh, Miriam take this away because this is. Okay, thank you, Scott. So, um, so in conclusion, what we hope to show you guys was how the AI actually makes decisions behind the scenes. Um, and through our experiments, we've truly demonstrated that AI can really make an impact on how we operate networks. Um, currently, because AI has been there for, for a few years, uh, there analysis techniques that now exist that actually allow you to open up the black box of AI. And one of the drop uh, criticisms of AI was we don't know what it is doing. So that's not the picture anymore. We can actually go and see what the AI is learning and we can improve that AI as well. So by adding much more add-ons like more AI modules such as the deep reinforcement learning plus the classification plus the prediction we can have much more controlled uh, and much more optimized decisions being made on our operations of networks. Currently, all of our efforts are now focused on the hardware transfer of uh, HECD onto these uh, chips so that we can port it into the wide area network. Um, we're, uh, we're working on this actively, the three of us. Um, what we've already done is the D reinforcement learning approach is already been working with network quantum networking tools. So that's another project I'm involved in, uh, where we've actually proven and gotten a better quantum network based on the deep reinforcement learning. And we're also thinking of how this can be extended to 5G networks as well. Um, but hopefully with a uh, Hecate coming out uh, pretty soon, uh, then we'll be able to show much more uh, influence into the wide area network. Um, and that's all from the three of us. Any questions? All right, well, thank you all for, for going through that. Uh, if people do have questions, please type them into the, the chat room and we'll, we'll get them answered. I have a couple quick ones that I can get us started with. Uh, so it looks like primarily right now you're using the persona data and you're using NetFlow data. Are there other forms of uh, monitoring measurement input that are gonna be considered for, for future work or are those the primary drivers right now? Um, I guess I could uh, pick that one up. Um, they are currently the primary drivers. Uh, as suggested, um, we are building it with the idea that there will be other um, data sources in, you know, that we'll probably end up being interested in using. But at the at the moment, that's currently all we're we're looking at. Okay. And we had two come in simultaneously. Doug wants to know: Has there been any work done with identifying microbursts, and as a result, choosing a different path that may look more busy on average, but in actuality might be faster due to the link being cleaner? So um, I can take that one. Um, so there. So this has recently come to my attention. Um, Harvey uh, is also working with me on this. So Harvey uh, brought, brought this challenge that if a, if a flow starts, can we make a prediction if it's gonna be a burst or, or no? Um, and uh, we've actually just started discussing what kind of AI we would do in order to recognize if it's gonna be a burst. Um, so hopefully over the next few months, we'll make some sorts of a algorithm which can allow us to determine if it's going to be a burst and then we can take that into account for the AI to make decisions on how to allocate that particular flow um, but uh, not not currently there is no work I checked as well uh, in literature I haven't found anything they've looked at uh, wavelet uh, transformations and um, uh, those kind of oscillating patterns to see if we can recognize if it's going to be a burst uh, but I haven't found any any literature on this yet. From kind of a um, from a data acquisition side, um, this might be a really interesting place for high touch to be used. As far as um, that does have sufficient uh, time, time resolution, resolution to do um, interesting kind of preversed analysis, and so that might be a really interesting aspect to look at in terms of. Um, kind of future work. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, next question was from Jim. Is the strategy to reroute running flows or use the AI result when picking paths for new flows and failure induced reroutes? So I, I can take that. Um, this is Nick. So I think one of the things that we didn't really get too deeply into is, is part of the stuff that I'm working on because it really hasn't happened yet. Um, the intention is to be able to use data that's generated by um, a PCE in segment routing environments to be able to ascertain all, you know, all of the information that the, you know, the PCE, the, you know, the controller for those environments has, which is, you know, latency information on links and, you know, the, the current topology of the network. So being able to take things like um, active SRTE routes and move them around proactively without a failure, I think is, is one of the main goals of this. Um, because, you know, as, as anyone that's worked with the, the PCs know that, you know, it's gonna generate a backup path if you tell it to. So it has a way to deal with failure modes, but it may not understand that I want to optimize for, let's say, you know, hop count or latency or one of the other attributes that it has knowledge of. So being able to consume that data and then make actionable, um, take action on on that is, is, I think, one of the main intentions of it. Hopefully that answered your question, Jim. All right, thanks, Nick. Uh, Ken is asking, is the AI machine learning learning from just the rerouted ES or from the routed ES net network? Uh, level three, or are you also uh, learning from other services like Oscars, LHC1, uh, the overlays and VRFs? Uh, Nick, do you want to take that one as well? So right now, we're only looking at um, sample data, you know, that we can generate ourselves uh, in the fullness of time. So the, one of the main tenets of this project is that it's very modular. So it should be able to consume nearly anything that we want it to consume. It's purposely built to not reinvent any wheels. So if there's a way to look at something or a data source or uh, incorporate a different um, piece of information, you know, we, we've purposely built it so that it, it can more easily do that. It's, it's very flexible and compatible in that way. Um, because the, the, you know, the first thing that kills things is, you know, if you're, if you're trying to reinvent something that's already done. So we, we've gone way out of our way to avoid any kind of recreation of, of things like, you know, how we're going to consume the data and how we're going to, index the data and things like that. But those are all things that have been optimized for what we want to do, but we didn't build anything that we didn't need to build. So right now, I guess, long story short is that we, we're not doing any, we're not pulling in any of that information like today, but there's nothing really precluding that later. It should be able to consume almost anything that we needed to consume as far as what the networks can generate. Okay. Uh, if there's any other questions, please type them in. I, I just have one more. Is this at the point where you guys are looking for uh, general feedback from anybody if they were to try to install or run this on their own networks, or is it still sort of in more of an internal project with, uh, with these results? So right now we're still coming to the, we haven't gotten to that point where we're looking for, um, for uh, other input on, you know, other people that want to use it, although that that's definitely coming. Uh, we don't uh, we don't have any uh, we don't have any current timeline for that because we're still trying to, to finish developing, putting the you know running this in into an FPGA. But we definitely will want some input into how it works on networks and environments that aren't ours uh, in the fullness of time. All right. Well, when we get to that stage, I'm sure we will share it with the community. Uh, looks like we are no more questions. So I will thank you three again for going over this stuff. Really, really great work. Uh, we'll make sure we get the video and the slides posted. And then for those that are still here, uh, next week's talk is going to be
from Tom Costello at Argon, and he is going to be going over a, a project that he's been working on using Raspberry Pis to do uh, Raspberry Pis and Docker to do some persona monitoring on the, the Argon campus. So hope to see people next week. And if not, we'll talk to everybody soon. Thanks a lot.